are listening to Reinvented. I am your host, Jen Eckhart. You know, I've had a lot of people on this show that I consider badass, and they all are in their own unique way. However, that being said, I'm pretty sure my next guest takes the cake for badassery. Yes, I just made that word up. He is known for his heart-stopping extreme stunt performances. He won the first ever X Games, landed the first ever double backflip in motocross history, built an empire with the Nitro World Games, an annual extreme sporting event, or Organized by Nitro Circus. But not just that, he's won championships, gold medals in supercross, motocross, freestyle motocross, rally racing. He's even driven in NASCAR, you guys, and has replicated three of Daredevil, Evil Knievel's most famous jumps without injury in record breaking fashion. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor welcoming the legend, the Travis Pastrana on the pod. Travis, welcome to Reinvented. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. That was a heck of an intro. I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> you can hire me as your PR agent after this. You know, before we start this interview, though, I have to rag on you a little because, you know, I just built you up so much. So now I got to I got to take you down a little to keep you humble. I have to know, what is it with you big name, high performing athletes who have AOL email accounts? It re- truly cracks me up. I interviewed seven time wrestling world champion Chris Jericho not long ago on this podcast. And he too has like the most ridiculously dated AOL email address. I mean, I even played some of the old dial up sounds ahead of the interview, (laughs) but I have to know, is there like some secret society (laughs) high performing public figures are in where you all like make a pack to hold on to your old AOL email address? I I think it's just priorities. I just never been something that I've, uh, I've ever thought to change. So it's been hacked a couple of times. We always get it back. You know, they got the good, uh, good firewalls on AOL. (laughs) That's amazing. I mean, the only person I know in my life besides you and Chris Jericho with an AOL email address is my 77 year old father. God bless him. Love him to death. But I just had to know if there was like a secret AOL society. Yeah, your dad actually leads the society. So I'm sorry to break it to you. (laughs) My dad leads it. I love it. Well, all right. On to more important topics. Travis, I wanted to bring you on my show Reinvented because to me, And to a lot of your fans, you exemplify reinventing yourself. You've raced motocross, freestyle, X Games, rally cross, NASCAR, offshore boat racing. I mean, you name it, you've done it. You've even jumped out of perfectly good airplanes, not to mention your TV success with your show, America's Got Talent. You're now a judge on NBC's America's Got Talent, a show where the world's most talented amateurs perform for star judges and compete for a life-changing prize. Having gone from one sport to the next, to the next exciting project, everyone out there wants to know, like, what is the secret sauce for Travis Pastrana behind being so successful in everything that you do? Uh, Passion. Uh, My dad says no one could ever mess up in reverse as much as I've messed up. Uh, Because when every door closes, they always say this, and it's a cliche, but something always opens. So I was hurt a lot in motocross. Motocross was was my passion. It was my, my dream. Every morning, um, you know, I woke up and that's all I wanted to do. From the time in the third grade, my dad said, look, you know, we come from construction. There's not a big construction, like small family construction. He's like, you know, we'll all take pay cuts, all of my uncles uh, and, and my dad. And, um, you know, we, we can pay for, for us to go and have a chance to do the nationals or go down to Florida. Um, this is a third grade. It's a big, you know, big choice. For but he's like, you have to go and you have to run one mile a day before school. He goes, I don't care if you're sick. I don't care if it's snowing. I don't care if it's raining and cold or hot. Um, and he said, if you do that, you know, all through your school year in the third grade, then, you know, we'll figure out a way to get you, uh, get you down in Florida. And for me, I, I was like, yeah, of course. And I was always challenged. My dad always said, my mom too, you know, you'll never make it as a professional athlete, but as long as that keeps you motivated, it keeps your grades up. Um, you know, and I finally, I, I did, we won, uh, X games. I say we, cause it was definitely my family and everyone getting you there. And joint victory. Uh, I love that. Yeah. Well, and then I kept getting injured and I kept getting injured. So every time I was hurt, um, you know, if you had a broken wrist or broken ankle, you could get on a go-kart or something that was four wheels a lot sooner. So I would get back and start driving things, uh, anything that I could get my hands on really. And as my professional career in motorcycles started to come to a halt because of injuries, Well, every injury had led me to being good enough, not great by any means, but good enough in a car, like every redneck American thinks that you can drive uh, to 
be able to get a, some of my sponsorship for motorcycles, took it to car racing and you just kept going from there. And as I got hurt more and, and did different things, I needed to figure out a way to film it. So we started, uh, you, you know, this cheated, you cheated death more. You needed a way to film it. I like saying cheated death. Yeah. Well, I mean, just long story long, everything that I've done has been because of a failure somewhere else or an injury or a need to be able to get like, there's no way to, to film uh, rally car racing or offshore power boats um, or even shenanigans like uh, Nitro Circus, where we started a kind of a, you know, a, a company that honestly, when Evil Knievel passed away, uh, Johnny Knoxville called up and said, hey, I need a list of a couple stunts. And I gave him 15 pages. And he said, can you do any of this? I said, I don't know, but we'll try them all. And uh, we had a show on MTV two weeks later. We'll just tick them off the list. I love that. I have to circle back to something that you did say. You said your father always challenged you. Starting in the third grade, did you really have to run a mile every morning when you woke up? I have to know this. <laughs> no, I didn't have to run a mile, but if I wanted to go to Florida to race motorcycles for the winter, because we're from Maryland, so Florida was 12 hours away. Um, you know, it's 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 a haul. My, my dad and mom would, you know, my mom was a flight attendant, um, so she would generally... Uh, you know, work the weekends and be with me during the week. My dad would work the weeks and he'd pick me up from school at, you know, 3 p.m. on a Friday and we'd drive 13 hours, 14 hours down to Florida. Um, you know, he'd drive all night and then we'd race and he'd work on the bike all night, uh, you know, from Saturday night to Sunday night. And then he'd drive all night back and we'd wow. get back just in time to drop me off at school and he'd go straight to work. So That's incredible. Um, I was very, very blessed and fortunate to have a family that was that sacrifice everything, not so I could succeed or so I could make it, um, just so I could do follow my dreams. And I think that's, that's the biggest key for my dad um, and my mom growing up was, it, you know, results never mattered to them, but effort did. And yeah. that was what they, they always preached was like, look, just, just give it your best. You'll never make it. My dad always said, you will never make it uh, in motocross. You'll never make it as an athlete. There's no way you'll, you know, but every day that you try your hardest, we'll, we'll support you. Oh, I love that. And they really pay, it sounds like they really paved the way for you to follow your passion and, and look at you now. I mean, you're on top, on top of the world, still cheating death, still doing crazy, insane stunts. I mean, seriously, all my viewers and listeners need to like YouTube. If you haven't heard of Travis Pastrana, I mean, you have like what, 4.2 million followers on Instagram. You have quite a fan base going on. You guys need to go watch what this guy does. It truly, he defies the odds. It really is insane. And speaking of parenting, you know, I just had uh, Rick Macy, who's the coach of Venus and Serena Williams on the podcast. I don't know if you see that's awesome, Richard. Yeah. But speaking of like, like he has a very odd, um, I guess not odd, a, a healthy style of parenting because, uh, when I interviewed the coach, who uh, is best friends with Richard, the, the girl's father, he was like, yeah, they, he always tried to keep him a kid. Like instead of pushing them into every tennis tournament, you know, he, he took them to Disney. They didn't let it go to their heads. He demanded that they got straight A's. Was your, were your parents like sticklers about uh, grades or schoolwork? You know, that's, that's really funny that, um, yeah, I, I haven't, I need to watch the movie. I need to, to, hey, to research film. more. No, I look, look great. Um, and definitely, you know, followed the, the Williams uh, the sisters all the way through. It's been an amazing journey. But um, no, it sounds very similar to to my father, uh, to my mom. Um, you know, if I didn't have, if I didn't stay on the honor roll, it uh, wasn't straight A's, but, you know, <laughs> was, uh, I actually graduated high school at, uh, at 15 uh, with a 3.9 GPA. So um, not because I was smart, just because I needed to get good grades for my parents to keep basically what I saw was, was all the, the sacrifices they were making. And, um, you know, my, my friend uh, and I went for a run and at, at that point it was five miles a day by the, you know, <laughs> by the seventh grade. And my dad uh, said he came around the corner and saw my friend was just, just sitting, um, you know, just watching his watch and, and waiting to come back. And he goes, I was so happy. I was hoping so much that I would see you right next to him having just told us that you would go, we're going on a five mile run and not actually running. He said, we would stop the motorcycles. I would stop driving all nights. We'd stop all this stuff. Uh, but, uh, you know, for me, that was, uh, quitting was never an option really. And that was not something that my parents, they, they never expected or necessarily even cared that I did well in sport. They just wanted to make sure that I had the best possible, most motivated upbringing um, with the, the most driven friends, if you will. I love that. You know, you go from one sport 
to the next, to the next exciting project. I mean, faster than Leonardo DiCaprio goes through girlfriends. And I mean, <laughs> and the thing is, is you win in all of these extreme sports. It's not like you just participate in them. Like you win all of them. Talk to me about the element of being able to reinvent and sort of fine tune yourself as an athlete, as you do age and get older. Well, what you find is that there's no such thing as an overnight success. Everyone says you're so lucky. Um, and I am. I was very lucky to be in a situation that um, I had a lot of support growing up from, a, from an amazing family. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of injuries that go to getting to any, uh, any impact sport. Um, you know, there's a lot of dangers, a lot of luck that goes in uh, to not be, be paralyzed. You know, when I was in a wheelchair for, for four months, um, having shattered my hips and pelvis and the third known case not to have bled out, um, you know, when I was on my 15th birthday. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it's tough for, for families and you know, for parents to say, you know what, I'm going to let you continue living your dream, even though this has just happened. And, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of luck that, that goes in there, but at the end of the day, everything that, that you do, it's, it's not like you just step into a car and, and you do amazing. A good example is Brandon Seminuk. Um, he's the best in the world at mountain biking right now. He just won Red Bull Rampage. Uh, he won the first time when he was 15 years old, uh, prodigy. He just won. He's 32, 31, 32. And he just won it again. Um, and this year he got third in the U.S. Rally Championship. So he's not only the best in the world on a mountain bike, but everyone's like, oh, he just came out from nowhere. And it's just, oh, he has money. And that's why he got in. No, he's been rallying since 2002. He's been rallying since he has his driver's license. He's built all his cars from the ground up. He knows every aspect of it. Um, kind of like me with, with rally cars. You know, I've always been in field cars in the backyard and always um, you know, sliding around the shop since I was two years old, I've had a go-kart. Like I've always, my life has been motors and wheels and anything that's exciting and fun. And all of those trials and tribulations as a, as a child, um, help you to build that foundation for what you're, what you're capable of doing, you know, after you're 18. And that was, I was very fortunate to be in a very redneck family that, that <laughs> liked bulldozers and, uh, and construction and sliding cars. And my uncle was in your uh, hands drag racing. So in your hands yeah, was- <laughs> <laughs> not if we're not afraid of dirt, Travis Pastrana, uh, but you have broken tons of records. You know, a friend of mine, Danny recently recalled watching you do your longest jump in long beach. And after you broke the record by about a hundred feet, you did a flip off the barge and you landed into the ocean. Uh, you take inspiration you mentioned from Evil Knievel. In fact, you paid tribute to the legendary stuntman by breaking a few of his records. Uh, in 2018 in Las Vegas, you safely cleared, and I have to say this for my viewers and listeners, you safely cleared three record-breaking big jumps, which consisted of 52 cars, 16 buses, and a fountain, respectively, for a total of 484 feet of jumps in a single night. That third jump over the Caesars Palace fountain was a jump that Knievel himself wasn't able to land in 1967 when he crushed his pelvis and his femur. How did you reinvent your stunts to do them again, but just bigger and better? Well, I mean, like you said, Evil Knievel did it, you know, in the the 60s and 70s. So we've got a lot more on our side. We have a lot more understanding of what flies. Evil invented the wheel. Um, And I just thought it was pretty cool because my dad um, and and his generation said, oh, back when men were men and, you know, bikes were crap and, oh, you know, there's basically the stuntman's gone. And then the new generation that doesn't really know about Evil Knievel. You know, when I, I asked my, my kids and their friends, like, um, you know, they didn't know who that like, was, which I was like, oh, man, that's a, they're that's like, a, it's huge, like, that's a parenting <laughs> fail on my part. Um, and it was an amazing opportunity on history to, to take a company that we started with Nitro Circus and to have the opportunity to kind of pay homage to the one, the, the, the stuntman that, that showed a motorcycle could fly, the person that kind of paved the road for X Games, for, for Nitro Circus, for all the stuff that, that we do now in action sports, for all the scooter riders and the BMXers and all the people going to the Olympics now and skateboarding. The kind of the pioneer was mm-hmm. this showman and he wasn't a very good motorcycle rider, but he had the courage to be able to basically go into these places, these Caesars fountain and, and sell himself and say, this is what we're gonna do. And then the courage also to back it up and I thought that's one interesting thing that that's kind of lost now with, with modern day sports um, is that the salesmanship of stunt uh, is kind of gone. I mean, Evil Knievel was was Mr. America. He had the stars and bars, you know, the, the V. If you think of, of a stunt, you think of, um, at least I do, it's a white suit 
and it's the um, basically the the stars that go down in the V shape that right. was just Evo Knievel. He had the cape, and uh, we wanted to kind of have an opportunity to show to bring three generations together. Um, you know, my dad's generation, my kids' generation, our generation, and not necessarily to to beat his stunts. I feel like it would have been a letdown to Evo Knievel if um, you know, if fifty years later or sixty years later we're still doing the exact same stuff that, that he's doing, but. <laughs> we took a motorcycle very similar to what he jumped ramps very similar to what he jumped and uh locations and and things that he jumped very very similar so um we were able to show what he did and you know the, the modern uh, changes that allow us to go bigger you know it's so funny when some people grow up they look up to i mean i don't know people who aren't exactly daredevils like they want to be a nurse or they want to be you know like a like an and thank goodness for nurses and doctors and yes. thank goodness for <laughs> nurses and doctors out there because i mean you're talking about evil Knievel, a man who has broken more bones than anyone else ever i think i don't even know if you have him beat i mean the list of injuries just goes on and on and on for you but i have to know what is the allure about doing these crazy stunts that put your life in danger i mean i know you get a rush from you know like an adrenaline junkie like doing these kinds of things but really what is it that drew you to doing these sorts of crazy stunts in the first place um you know honestly it was my family my uh i have well two uncles on my mom's side and five uncles on my dad's side um my uncle alan uh was quarterback for denver broncos uh back in 69 and 70 And he said football was too dangerous. So he didn't really ever teach me how to throw or catch. I was the the runt of the family. I was a scrawny one that always got beat up on the, you know, when we had our our Thanksgiving football games. And the only way for me to prove myself uh, was basically being able to jump higher bridges into water or doing more flips. Or when I got a motor, it was to be able to twist the throttle because I surely wasn't as strong or as fast as all my my cousins are all, you know, division one football and wrestlers and all American lacrosse and um, I didn't have those types of skills, um, but what I found was I was extremely durable. And in action sports, that's a huge quality to have. Um, you know, it, it sounds really silly, but I could take a fall. And when I was falling, I always kind of worked my way out of it. I never, you know, not never, I got a lot of injuries, obviously, but I was very good at making the best of really bad situations. For example, when you're in the air and you're going 60 miles an hour, you're 45 feet, 55 feet off the ground and something's going wrong. And you have to make the decision now, I have to now jump off of my motorcycle. I can neither run (laughs) 60 miles an hour or or take a five-story drop to my feet. But if I can push off of this and land on that downside, or there's a hay bale over there, or how can I make this hurt the least? Because if I stay on the motorcycle, I'm gonna break my neck. This 250 pound bike is gonna smash me in the ground. But this is where time slows down for me. And I'm able to kind of roll out of things that other people aren't. Um, you know, it's like a football player. If, you know, he can see everything in slow motion. Okay. Right. This is a 300 pound man running at full speed towards me. This is, and I got to hit this person over here running at, at full speed this way. Um, it's been really interesting. And I've been able to see with my kids now, I have a, you know, a six and a seven year old or six and an eight year old. Two and daughters. Yeah. Two daughters. One of them, has my stuntman mentality where when things hit the fan, she smiles, she starts talking faster. Her brain starts working quicker. She's never hurt. She does the dumbest stuff. She falls out of trees all the time. She flips off the trampoline. She's doing all this crazy shenanigans, never had any injuries. My youngest, she's focused. She's a good worker. She's, um, you know, she's coordinated, but the second things hit the fan, like she doesn't do anything outside of her like comfort zone. She and when like freezes or she freezes if it's something happens that shouldn't happen so she doesn't do anything dangerous and yet she's the only one that's had any types of injuries i mean nothing broken thank right. you this at this point but like you know always has like the black eyes and the skinned elbows and she's like how does you know my older sister get away with everything right. and i think that mentality has so much to do with how i've been able to stay alive this long if you will and yeah. actually support Seriously, but it's so true. You have to be quick on your feet and you have to almost like do the math when you're in the air. You have to be a quick thinker because it really is a matter of life and death. Well, and also most people can't make the decision. If you're in the air and you say, okay, if I stay on the bike, I'm going to break my neck. But if I jump off, I'm going to break both ankles. Right. Most people say, it's all bad. <laughs> when I can go, okay, I'll take the ankles. You yeah, know? Right. And that's, 
You'll take the lesser, the, the less painful of the injury, if you will, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. Well, honestly, I ended up breaking my back when I was 15 because I just got broken both wrists. And I was like, oh, you know, I just got my cast off. Um, and that's bad at, you know, at 14 years old when your mom and dad has to like wipe your butt when you go to the bathroom because you Gosh. got two full arm casts. It's kind of an embarrassing time for that. All of it. Well, any time's embarrassing, Humbling. I guess. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but I just come off two broken wrists and I'm like, okay, let me just lean back. I'm going to take all of this on my legs. I'm not going to break my arms again. And then I brought my back. So, you know, I learned that maybe a third option would have been better. <laughs> you know, I'm a big fan of yours because you just, you conquer fears. And we're a big fan of that here on Reinvented. You know, on September 26, 2007, I did do a little research on you. I am a journalist. You jumped out of an airplane over uh, Arecibo, Puerto Rico, without a parachute in a carefully choreographed stunt. Uh, you met up in midair with another jumper, then latched yourself into a harness to make a safe tandem landing. That was insane. You apparently got in a lot of trouble due to its illegality. I have to know for my viewers and listeners, like what happened and what was the punishment for doing such a crazy stunt? Because I'm pretty sure that is illegal jumping out of an airplane with no parachute. So honestly, it, it came down to the, the pilot was an FAA. You can't have a door open without everyone in, in the plane with a parachute on. Um, so we just, and then we went to Puerto Rico, which I found out is a territory of the U S which I should know because I have <laughs> ancestry in Puerto Rico, but I was like, Oh, that's, you know, I should be able to do this here. We're on a beach. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, every, everybody was either military or ex-military. So, um, nobody had their, they all had their licenses, but they didn't do that for a living, um, per se. Uh, so I, and I thought military did I see correctly in that YouTube video were you shotgunning a beer before jumping out of no, the no 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 Red Bull Red Bull gives oh, you wings it was, it was a, gives you, um, so okay. I was, I, was I know Red Bull the sponsor of yours so hmm but Red Bull actually pulled all of the the best they call it the Red Bull Air Force all of the best skydivers in the world are Red Bull um, it's just kind of what their marketing was at the time so that's who I went to first yeah. They said, no, absolutely not. Um, we don't, we can't lose our licenses. This is, uh, this can't work. You don't have enough skydives. This is, this is a bad idea. So to be honest, everyone's like, how much do they pay you? I'm like, actually, I almost lost my Red Bull ride for, for doing this. Having said that, um, how do you can also that? like, how were you like, no, no, no. I promise. Like I, I'm good at what I do. <laughs> I'm going to stay alive. Like, how did you convince them? Um, well, honestly, it was mostly the military guys and they came down they're like, this will be simple. So we did one test run and then they're like, yeah, that worked out great. Like, let's go for it. So that was, lived. yeah, but, yeah we, we got you. I mean, military, they never leave a man behind. I was like, I got this. I, I really it. thought they'd renegotiate on the way down. Like, how much is it worth now? You know, it, no, right. I'm joking, but yeah. I love it. That's awesome. Well, speaking of cr other crazy stunts, you rode your dirt bike off a ramp and did a backflip as you fell 2,000 feet into the Grand Canyon. As I mentioned earlier, you were also the first to land a double backflip at the 2006 X Games in LA, which earned you a gold medal. I mean, I got chills watching that footage back on YouTube. And I love how the camera panned to your mom and she was like, oh my God, like, what is my son doing? But I have to know out of all the crazy stunts you have done and you've done a lot, is there any one that really like shook you to your core that left you like a little rattled, like a little scared to, to move on? Um, you know, I, I think your decision process, this, for me, scared doesn't come during the stunt. Scared comes at the moment when you decide to do it. Mm -hmm. um, coming from a military, my dad was a Marine and it's like, you're a man of your word. If you say you're going to do something, you got to do it. And that left me in trouble a few times when I opened my mouth, I said I was going to do something. And then I realized on the moment I wasn't either good enough or the bike wasn't fast enough or the jump was too big and you still have to do it anyway. So I think the dumbest thing that I've ever done is doing something that you know is going to fail before you start. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's something that I had a lot of respect for Evo Knievel, who had that same mentality when he went to Wembley Stadium. Um, the motorcycle didn't have the speed to do the jump that was set up. And he didn't realize this until he was moments before the jump and the stadium was packed and live TVs there. And he went on the microphone and said, hey, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to make this jump, yeah. but I promised you all a show. I said I would do it. 
I told the ramp builders how far to make it. I told the bike builders what kind of bike I needed. I was wrong. Enjoy the show. And as that could be possibly the dumbest thing that anyone's ever done, but also I really liked it because you do one thing as you do all things. And for me in this day and age, to take accountability for your failures is something that doesn't happen very often, but you see most of the most successful people, they don't place blame other places. If you look at it, at the end of the day, you sign off on the people that are gonna be building your ramps or you're building the ramps yourself. You sign off on your motorcycle. You tell the TV or you tell you know whoever that you're gonna do something. That is now your responsibility to, to come through with, with what you promised. And that goes in, in relationships, that goes in, in every aspect of life. Yeah. Um, so for me, I try not to open my mouth as much now as I used to. <laughs> and that's what I've learned from these situations. Yeah, right. Your mouth can get you into trouble, but I think you are, you know, you that's so profound what you said. Anything worth doing is worth doing right. Being a man, being a woman of your word. And if you're, you know, put your money where your mouth is. If you say you're going to do something, you know, follow through, but also take accountability and, and own up. If you think you can't do this, you know, you've sustained so many injuries, Travis, I mean, a dislocated spine, torn ACL, PCL, LCL, MCL. How many L's all, are all there? The CLs. All the CLs. All the CLs. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you covered that that turf. Broken uh, your tibia, fibula, all the ibulas you you've broken. You once, <laughs> you actually once separated your spine from your pelvis when a motorbike landing went wrong. I have to know, do you have any regrets? You know, all of my regrets uh, to this point are things that I didn't do things that I was too afraid to take the chance on. Um, you know, there's definitely hindsight is 2020 and there's a lot of things that I wouldn't do knowing the outcome, but you go into every circumstance. And as long as you've done your homework, as long as you understand what the risks are, what the rewards are, and that's always changing. Yeah. Um, for me to take the risk that I took when I was 16, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me. I, you know, I've had a great career. I'm very fortunate to, to continue living my dreams. Um, I have an amazing wife. I have two young girls. I, not to say that you don't have as much to live for when you're 16, but at 16, my option is construction, which is family construction. Like that's great, but you have an option to, to maybe, just maybe be the best in the world, do something that no one's ever done. And that was worth it at the moment. Now, when someone's like, oh, so-and-so just did a triple backflip, when are you going to do four? I'm like, yeah, no, no, no real interest. I, I, that sounds great. I'm looking for, I will be there watching. I'll be there cheering the next guy on. I'm mm -hmm. proud of that. But, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, risk to reward is always changing. You know, aside from doing all this, all of these stunts, you're just a regular guy from Maryland. In fact, we have a mutual buddy, which I mentioned prior to starting this interview, Tommy Pazamente. I Street bike Tommy. <laughs> Street bike Tommy. He's so great. I asked him, what's one thing you can tell me about Travis that like no one out there would really know? Oh, this, this is scary. No, 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 <laughs> not, not bad. But he actually just said it's pretty hilarious that you live in like a regular neighborhood. You play pickleball with the neighbors. You like to drink and carry on at the legion you know but he did it was actually really nice what he said he said nothing and i mean nothing comes before your family as a family man how do you i have to know how do you manage to balance that with being on the road all over the world almost like the entire year um you know that that's a tough question it's it's getting tougher as the kids start at school and um for me i want to show the kids my kids what it takes to make it look like it's easy and the amount of work that goes in the amount of time that we spend i mean um you know my wife uh, she's two-time world champion uh, three-time x games gold medalist in skate total bad and, by the way welcome on reinvented yeah. anytime she wants by the way awesome <laughs> no, Lindsay, Lindsay's absolutely amazing and even more than that she's an amazing mom and she really took to motherhood and i, I was i really was encouraging her i said look i'll take a year two years off um, at the time when skating came into the Olympics, I said, you, you can do this. And she went and she won the world championship again at 30 years old, um, you know, a year and a half before the Olympics. And she said, I just miss my kids too much. The work that it takes to be the best, I'm missing these, these moments and these times that are more important for me as a mom. Then she goes, stand, so she was in Spain, the world championship for, for skate. And she goes, I was standing on that podium, having just won the world championship, thinking, 
oh, I just cannot wait to get home. Even in that moment, it was more important for her to be with the kids. And I'm so fortunate to have a wife that, you know, is so passionate and, and is okay with, with being home as I'm gallivanting, uh, you know, around the world. But what is really cool about my job is that when I'm home, I'm home. And I feel like most dads, especially, but most parents, you know, they might be home, but they're always working. They leave for work, you know, before the kids wake up or they get back late or they're doing whatever. When I'm home, I am 100% in and I get to have these amazing weeks. You know, I had two weeks off over Christmas and New Year's. Like that's two, you know, it snowed. We went out back. We got all this kind of amazing play area. And, you know, we were able to do things with the kids that, um, that their reality is a little bit, a little bit different. I mean, we jumped into a, a 500 foot Canyon and my, my, you know, eight-year-old just runs off and jumps. She's like, cowabunga, um, <laughs> literally a 400 foot vertical drop. And then, you know, the rope catches and it's like a big swing, but, um, you I know, for them, wanna, it's, I kind of want to play in Travis Pastrana's backyard, <laughs> like paint the picture for how is your backyard? Cause when I think of your backyard, I picture like ramps and canyons and like bungee jumping cords, like what, what rock climbing walls. Maybe there's a plane back there. I mean, what does the backyard look like for Travis Pastrana? I have to know. Yeah. I mean, that's, it, it turned, it went from basically an action sports Mecca where all the best in the world from, you know, every different country and especially when Olympics, when, uh, you know, action sports went in there. Um, that's where people did stuff and still do stuff that have never been done. Uh, but right now it's more of a kid's land. It's all basically downsized for my kids and their friends. And yes, we have a rock climb wall. That's like a, you know, it's a cave that's bouldering over top of the you floor. Pit. I knew you had a rock climb. Of course we had a mechanical bull, but as Tommy, that, that was the most dangerous <laughs> thing we had. So we, uh, we got rid of that, but we have slip and slides and, Somebody um, you know, wait, no, you can't just tease that and not tell the story. What happened with the mechanical bull? Someone as it turned out, as you got better at driving the mechanical bull, you could actually keep people on that were trying to fall off and, and just beat them basically to death before you threw them off. Not that I ever did that. I'm just hypothetically speaking. Oh, right, yeah, got, right. Yeah. Hypothetically speaking, you know, you <laughs> mentioned your wife. She is an absolute badass, uh, Lindsay. And she's part of what, what makes her so cool is she is part of a very like small elite group of female professional skateboarders. Um, unicorns. They're yeah, unicorns. She is a unicorn. <laughs> and uh, she's like a little like Ever Levine, like, you know, except she actually like skates. I mean, in 2001, you stopped the show at the Nitro Circus Live World Tour in Las Vegas, got down on one knee and proposed, which was so sweet. You then, as you said, went on to have these two girls. Do you see your daughters in the future doing daredevil stunts like their dad? Do you want them to follow in your footsteps? You know, I want my daughters to do whatever makes them happy, whatever their passion is. I hope that they're not as passionate about motorcycles or BMX or skateboarding as, you know, as their mom is about skaters. I'm about motorcycles, cars. I, I think I could, I could encourage that at, at some points, um, <laughs> you know, but right now they're both in a cheer, competitive cheer. Um, they're very competitive oh, against each other. I was a competitive cheerleader. That's music to my ears. I'm so awesome. excited for that. Maryland twisters. I don't know. We went to Disney last year. They, they won the one, I guess every, what I don't. So, so tell me this. They won like the area qualifier and they got national championship jackets. They're like, we won the national championships. So I'm thinking there's every cheer gym and like every area has national championships. So that was a little off. And then they went to regionals, which was down in Disney. Right. And they won that. And they said they won. Uh, I forget what that one was called. And then they went on to the one and then they won the one. And they everyone, they're like, we won the one. I was like. Oh, I think Disney was Worlds. And then after that, I'm like, whatever is above Worlds is Nationals. You right. guys have a very confusing system on how to say the national championship. It's so I was super proud of them. I feel in my head, I'm doing the math. I feel like they won the national championship in their division last year, but they, right. your, your scoring system is way off. Our scoring system is a little off. I also think for like younger competitive cheerleaders, it can be that way. But listen, it's a serious sport. And I love that we have here on the record, Travis Pastrana, saying like, can we have you on the record saying yes, cheerleading is a sport because that is a big controversy in America. A lot of people are like, oh, that's not a sport. It is 
physically so demanding, so challenging. And it really is a matter of trust, having to trust your fellow teammates. Like I was a flyer. I would, I was the one who, you know, I wasn't on a dirt bike like you, but I would get thrown up, you know, hundreds of feet in the air and I would have to trust whoever below me was going to catch me. And there were times Did that you I say hundreds up. of feet in the air, hundreds of feet. Okay. Maybe not um, hundreds. That, I meant, I, I want to, I want to see that. Okay. That would be amazing. <laughs> I might've exaggerated just a teeny bit, but so, yeah, it's a serious sport. Interestingly enough, my oldest was a flyer. My youngest was a flyer. They both moved up. My youngest moved up two levels. My oldest moved up one level. Um, and my youngest beat her out for the job of flyer. My oldest cried for a week oh. and then got the, so there's two tumblers. Right. And she moved. She's like, I am not being a base for my <laughs> younger sister. I will. I refuse. I quit right now. And she cried for a week. I'll and then drop her. I'll drop her were, out of spite. <laughs> she exactly. And they were like, okay, so this is what you need to do to be one of the tumblers. And she's, she learned a couple of things right off the bat. She's like, well, I can standing back to talk and I can do this and I can do that. You know, the most disappointing moment uh, of the most, I felt I've let down my kids at any point in my life and my wife as well. We had the same feeling when my six-year-old learned a standing back tuck. She said, mom, dad, let's get a picture. All of us doing backflips. Now we can all do flips. And my oldest is like, yeah. And Lindsay and I looked at each other. I'm like, I need a dirt bike to do a flip. She's like, I need a skateboard to do a flip. Maybe a trampoline. <laughs> they were so <laughs> devastated. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. I remember how monumental it was a big moment for me when I could do my round off back handspring back tuck. That was a that was a big deal. I have to give props to your little girl because I could I could never do a standing back tuck. That's that's hard. So so props to them. I mean, you it sounds like you really are raising little daredevil athletes. So that's that's awesome. I love hearing like Travis Pastrana. You hear about you like the extreme sport athlete, but sort of peeling back the layers on Travis, the dad. Your dad. <laughs> uh, you know, in, in watching a video of you landing a double backflip on a dirt bike, like I said, it was a sweet moment when the camera panned to your mom, who literally could not bear to watch. Well, hold up. That was not a sweet moment. I've never come so close to wringing a reporter's neck. They, it's a, okay. Before the, the, you know, my mom, she's like, I'm like, mom, I've got it. I get, I know I have this, no problem. And then a reporter came around the corner and this, Oh, you know, this, this girl is super nice girl. And, and I, I known her from yes, doing yes. other events. Like, your yes. son could die today. How's that make you feel? <gasps> what would you think of yourself as a parent? If he, if he kills himself and he breaks his neck or he's paralyzed. And my mom just broke down, melted into a little ball and oh. I'm getting ready to go do something that could be such an amazing really thing. Of and I'm holding right. my mom who's crying on the ground while the cameras are live. And I'm like, how on earth? I mean, obviously the girl at the time wasn't a mom and I hope right now to this day, I hope she's listening to this and, and literally like, how can you do that to a parent? Yeah. Like how can, like my mom, I thought she was going to have a heart attack. I really, I honestly was more concerned for her when I was going up to do this stunt than I was for, for me. Like I would be fine. I, it, it broke my heart. And then like, you know, so that, anyway, sorry, but it was, for no, me, that wasn't a cute moment. That was a, no, that was it's a, not. And yeah. as a journalist, you know, that pains me to hear because, you know, reporters can be pretty relentless when it comes to this kind of stuff. And they're really, it's self-serving in a way, because it's like, they're looking out for just like that one sound bite, right. That makes the news, but they and it did. It made, to be fair, that's the moment that, that you remember. It's the moment that brought, it's the moment that made what the stunt that I was doing, the silly circus trick on a dirt bike, it, that made it real. It made it powerful, but it, by almost, and I, I've been in the limelight. Like I understand you've been in the limelight. Like people are harsh. It, it is what it is. And you have to just know what the facts are. But I think as a parent, when you break it down like that, that, you know, how do you feel to yourself as a parent to allow your kid to do something that, that might kill them? And that, that's a tough, it's a tough moment. Awful. I, you know, but look, you, you, you did it, you it did it. And, and I hope that reporter learned a lesson from this. Like, Hey man, don't, don't, uh, don't, don't go there. Don't No, don't. They, they didn't. I'm sure. I, I didn't strangle them. So that was, it was that. <laughs> I have to know, has there ever been a time that your mom or even your wife has been like, Travis, look, you can't do this. Like you are a father. Now you need to stop. Have you, have you ever had like a, like a come to Jesus moment? Like, okay, we got to sit this guy down and we got to talk to them or have they always just really been supportive? 
Um, you know, my mom, when I broke my back, uh, basically I shattered my pelvis, um, what you said, dislocated spine. Basically it was, I dislocated both SI joints. Your spine got dislocated from your pelvis? Basically, so in layman's terms, yes. I dislocated both SI, both sacroiliac joints. So when everyone's like, oh, you know, my S, SI joints or whatever, when they get the, the sciatic pain, um, everything's fused for me. So I don't, I don't get that pain, which is nice. Uh, but basically I bled out two thirds of my blood volume over three days. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that you don't really, you know, necessarily come back from too quick. But yeah. I woke up in a different state. I was sedated basically in a medically induced coma. Uh, for almost two weeks, 10 days. And when I woke up, my mom was there and she had been by my side the whole time. And she looked 50 years older than, than when I had crashed. And, um, you know, I'm kind of coming to and figuring out what's going on. And my mom's like, please tell me this is, this is it. No more, no more X games, no more, you know, 15 years old, uh, no more dirt bikes. And at that moment I said, mom, I, I love, like, this is what I love. I, is that jump still there? I want to try it again. I know what I did wrong. Wow. And she like tears coming down her eyes and just, she kind of started giggling and she's like, I can't take that from you. Why do you do this to me? I cannot take this dream, this passion, this love. If in the most pain you've ever been in, all you can think of is getting back out there and doing it. At the time, I didn't even know if we we're going to be walking again. You know, I, <laughs> She's just shaking her head. And um, I was just very fortunate that she didn't at that point pull everything. Because my life would have been very different. I still would have had a lot of the injuries that I had. Uh, my knees still would have been messed up. My back would have been messed up. But I wouldn't have followed through this, this dream to fruition. And I would have never known if I was good enough. Uh, if, if this was a, a passion that I would have always had doubt and regret. And I probably would have had a lot of animosity towards my parents for, for not allowing me to chase my dreams. Yeah, and all my friends in construction would have said, yeah, right. You'd have never made it. Exactly. I'd have been like every other guy. Yeah, I would have, man. I was good. <laughs> you proved all those naysayers wrong. I love it. You know, I have a friend of mine, Shay Adam, who's a pit reporter. I consulted with her and Tommy ahead of this interview. We both want to know you've competed in almost every facet of racing, and yet you've only done a handful, I believe five total of sports car races. You did two Porsche uh, Super Cup races and the Rolex 24 of Daytona back in 2012. But I don't think you've come back since. What is it about that area of sport that kind of spooks you or scares you? Um, well, to be honest, it was like NASCAR. I've realized that I'm not, my strength is not necessarily being more precise, more consistent. It's not understanding the vehicle and being able to talk to my pit crew to tell them how to make it better. My expertise is pushing the limit and, and understanding where that boundary is and being willing to take more risk where it can make time. So in sports car, in anything pavement, um, you can't make up for lack of talent uh, with a little bit more risk, a little bit more dare, a little bit more um, chance. Because right. by the time you're taking a risk, you're already burning off your tires. You're already slowing down. You're already sideways. You're already messing up. Right. Um, so precision driving, the, the more OCD type of very meticulous um, and you can see it in the F1 drivers. It's how they dress. It's how they talk. It's how they present themselves compared to the NASCAR drivers that are a little bit more loose. And then the rally drivers that are Yay, first or last kidding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's in NASCAR. It has an interesting uh, persona because the drivers are some of the smartest guys um, really in, in, in racing and they're, they're very articulate in their, their own way, but uh, NASCAR, you can slide a little bit more and there's a little bit more freedom. Uh, whereas in, in, open wheel racing, you have to be even more precise. Your braking points, are, they don't change. NASCAR, the tires kind of go away. So you slide a bit around and you got to kind of play the wind. And there's just, there's a lot more that you have to do spur of the moment. Um, whereas open wheel racing, you're exactly as good as your car is. So you have to be very meticulous for how you talk to your team and how you, how you change you, what you're doing. You can only go as fast as the car will let you go. And if you try to go faster, you actually go slower. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you something that no one will probably understand, but it'll 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 confuse you for a while. I went to Jimmy Johnson, um, seven-time NASCAR champion, uh, yeah. you know, doing IndyCar now. I said, Jimmy, how do I go faster? He said, Travis, if you think you're going fast, you're not. If you think you're going slow, you are. And if you think you can go faster, you can't. 
and he walked away. And that that really confused me for, <laughs> for the majority of my NASCAR <laughs> year. And what he meant was, if you think you, oh, well, <laughs> if you think you could have gone faster, that means you were probably right on the edge. And that's probably as quick as you can go. Mm -hmm. So even if someone's going faster, you got to figure out a way to make the car work better. That's probably as fast as you're going to get. But if you think you're going slow, you, you are. Like if you ever think I left a little bit on the table, you definitely did. But if you think you're going super fast, that means you're sliding, you're out of control and you're losing that drive. Right. Okay. I probably lost everyone. So we can get back to the normal. No, no, not at all. I it. Interesting perspective. But like, do you see yourself getting back into sports car racing at all in the future? Sorry, that was a long tangent. No, I'm not good enough. Um, so I would love to do. Yeah. I, You're good at everything. You're Travis Pastrana. What yeah. But rear wheel drive, um, when in doubt, throttle out doesn't work. Motorcycles, we have a saying. When in doubt, throttle out. It means when everything starts getting sideways, you grab a handful of throttle and it'll straighten the motorcycle back out. Um, with rally cars, we have all wheel drive. So when in doubt, as long as the front tires are pointing where you want to go, I mean, don't get me wrong. You can have too much speed and fly off the road, but you're never too sideways to make the corner work. So with rear wheel drive, when in doubt, lift, like mm -hmm. use the brake and kind of get off the throttle to get it settled. So it, it's innately opposite of everything I've ever learned. So when I'm pushing the envelope, I have a tendency to push the throttle and that spins me into the wall, uh, which is yeah. really hard to get a ride or sponsorship when you're crashing all the time. Um, also with pavement, it's not about being aggressive. Like dirt, is if you're aggressive and you're sliding, you can always kind of make time. You can grab time. Uh, you can take risk. Uh, with pavement, it's really the, the time is in not messing up. So mm -hmm. when you look at the entire 40-person NASCAR field, being able to qualify within a half a second on a mile and a half course, a half of a second from first to last, you're not going to gain time, but it's really easy to lose it. Yeah, that's a fair point. Very fair. So no, safe to say no sports car racing. No, no, no. I would, I would absolutely love to do 24 hours Le Mans. I would love to do all this stuff, but it's expensive to do. So you either have to pay for it yourself or you have to be good enough to win. Right. I am not good enough to win on that type of, of racing. And I have not convinced my wife that I need to buy a Porsche or a Ferrari or um, any of those vehicles to go race uh, in a race that I usually crash. <laughs> well, I think it's safe to say that whatever comes next for you, you will only continue to add to your legacy of pushing the boundaries of extreme sports that you compete in and just completely amaze people. I mean, you really do amaze me, Travis. But I have to know before we go, what event have you never participated in that's on your bucket list that you're like, man, or even just like a stunt, like something you'd really, that just remains on that bucket list for you. You know, I just, despite my better judgment, I do have one trick on a motorcycle that I believe could be really, really awesome. And I know I should pass it down to maybe a J.O. Archer or a Harry Bink or someone kind of pushing themselves in the industry right now. Um, but I, I really think I could do it. So maybe, maybe on that, but definitely um, drag racing. I've never done. I think the four wide drags, um, top fuel drag racing, um, just one time just to go down uh, as fast as I absolutely can uh, would be absolutely amazing. It's not something that I want to get into, but it's definitely something that's on my bucket list that I've never tried. Are you able to share the motorbike uh thing that you would do the stunt that you no, do, absolutely like, not because then someone else would do it before i had a chance to decide if i want to do it i didn't even think about i didn't even think about that of course they would well awesome well we will be keeping our eyes on you travis i mean i don't know about you but this interview has made me want to go out and do some gnarly stunts on a city bike here in manhattan new york that's about as the video <laughs> That's about as crazy as it gets for this city girl. Travis, thank you so much for taking the time to come on Reinvented to share your incredible story and how you've managed to reinvent yourself over the years as an athlete, father, and husband. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's good you talking. Know, I have a I have a koozie here that says, What would Jonathan Taylor Thomas do? My friend Travis gave it to me. We got it, we gotta get a what would Travis Pastrana do <laughs> podcast studio. What is Jonathan Taylor Thomas doing? I haven't heard his name in forever. That's a great feel. question. In fact, if he's listening to Reinvented, he ought to come on and talk about what he's been up to. Uh, but you know, if listen, if I'm ever in LA at the same time as you, it would be a bucket list item of mine to go skydiving one day with the Travis Pastrana 
because that is the biggest fear of mine, jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. Although I prefer to jump out of the plane with a parachute, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that would make sense. Well, be careful what you ask for. You just might get it. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, listen, keep kicking ass and pushing the limits. And hey, be sure to look out for Travis as a judge on NBCAmerica.com. To all my viewers and listeners, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to Reinvent Center. Our stuff's available wherever you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple, you name it, it's there. I'm Jen Eckhart. That was Travis Pastrana. Thank you for listening.